Uh, welcome to the Natural History Museum. We just opened a week ago. We're a new museum, now officially a dues-paying member of the American Alliance of Museums. And um, we do everything that traditional natural history museums do. So we do exhibitions and expeditions and educational workshops and public programming. Um, but unlike traditional natural history museums, we make a point to include and highlight the social and political forces that shape nature. Um, so with this inaugural exhibition, we're doing um, a series of programming events and panel discussions over the next month. Um, that will interrogate the influences that affect the atmospheric climate on Earth, as well as the political funding climate in natural history museums. So that's one of the things that we do with this museum, um, is uh, look at the ways in which um, spaces that communicate science and construct our understandings of nature, um, th the ways in which they do construct those representations. So you'll see in the exhibition here, we've taken photographs in uh, about five natural history museums on the eastern seaboard of the United States. And there's a essay that corresponds with the exhibition. So you're welcome to pick that up at the back. It's called Exhibiting the Gaze. So are we looking at a diorama of a, uh, are we looking at a bear? Or are we looking at a diorama of a bear? Um, and if it's a diorama, then um, someone or some people were involved in the construction of that display of nature. And is there a politics to those choices? Um, and is anything omitted or excluded? So these are the questions we seek to raise. Um, we're interested not just in um, critique, um, but also in kind of leveraging the vocabulary of natural history museums, their aesthetics, their pedagogical models and presentation forms in order to tell stories about nature that um, offer a perspective of nature as a commons. Um, so in exhibiting the gaze, as you see um, man as a part of these displays, these constructions of nature, um, we recognize that there is a, a perspective that shapes um, those understandings, right? And is that perspective influenced by the fossil fuel industry or the far right of the 1%? Um, is it a perspective that understands nature as something to be chopped off, uh, chopped up and sold off to the highest bidder? Or is it a perspective that understands nature as a commons to all of us, for all of us, and for generations to come? So with this panel, um, we're asking many of those questions today. It's called Words from Our Sponsors, Oil Industry Greenwashing in Cultural Institutions. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Stephen Duncombe, who's a professor at Gallatin and at uh, Media Culture, Media Culture and Communications at NYU. Um, he's also the founder, co-founder of the Center for Artistic Activism. Um, and he's going to introduce today's panel um, and today's panelists. Welcome, Steve. Welcome, visitors. Welcome to the Natural History Museum. And welcome to our panel, words from our sponsors, the oil industry, greenwashing, in cultural institutions. So museums are the top three destination for families in the United States. And actually, the number one most trusted source of information. In 2001, the American Alliance of Museums sponsored an independent survey of adult Americans and found that 87% of those surveyed viewed museums as, quote, one of the most trustworthy sources of objective information. In 2006, a survey was conducted of Americans and came up with the same conclusions, that, quote, museums evoke consistent, extraordinary public trust among diverse adult users. But probably the most important study to date occurred in 2010, and the researchers asked a simple question. How much do you trust or dis distrust the following as a source of information about global warming? 
Science museums and natural history museums were the most trusted sources, with 73% and 72% respectively of those surveyed expressing trust in these institutions. Weather reporters, military leaders, and perhaps not too surprising, mainstream news media scored the lowest in the survey with 52%, 42%, and 35%. Our big revered science and natural history museums, like New York's American Museum of Natural History or Washington DC Smithsonian, occupy a position of scientific authority on the natural environment. The claims they make carry the weight of a century-old institutions. There are museums from which all other museums of natural history are modeled and against which all other museums are measured. Their influence on culture ripples through everything that borrows from that position of authority, from children's books to scientific journals. No measure of nature is without a relationship to the authority of the museum. But with austerity measures, budget cuts, and market pressures, museums are increasingly reliant on private funding and corporate cash. As public funds diminish, donors from the political far right and the economic 1% are entrenching themselves into our cultural institutions, while ironically lobbying for the sequester and budget cuts to those same institutions. Which brings us to today, to this room, and to these questions. What does it mean when individuals like David Koch are board members and exhibit sponsors at the American Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian Institute? What is the impact of the embeddedness of the fossil fuel industry in our cultural institutions, science education, and communication? And as important, what can we do about this? To help us with these questions, we have some experts in the room. Dr. Alice Bell, you can, there we go, exactly, is a freelance journalist specializing in the politics of science and technology. She writes about innovation for how we get to next and climate change for the road to Paris. She's a science policy blogger for The Guardian and columnist for Popular Science UK and is working on a short history of the radical science movement for Wellcome Trust's Mosaic magazine. She previously worked as an academic, Condolences, lecturing in science communication at Imperial College, where she also set up an interdisciplinary course on climate change and acted as head of public engagement at the Science Policy Research University of Sussex. Before that, she worked extensively in science education, including at the London Science Museum, and she completed a PhD on children's science media. Kurt Davies is the founder and executive director of the Climate Investigation Center. He is a well-known researcher, media spokesperson, and climate activist who has been conducting corporate accountability research and campaigns for more than 20 years. Davies was the chief architect of the Greenpeace web project Exxon Secrets, launched in 2004, which helped expose the oil giant Exxon Mobil's funding of organizations and individuals who work to discredit the validity of climate science and delay climate policy action. More recently, Davies established the Polluter Watch program at Greenpeace, which launched the report, Coke Industries Secretly Funding the Climate Denial Machine. But before we bring these great guests to speak, we are gonna start with a recorded video address of someone who couldn't be here, Robert Jaynes. Robert Jaynes is the editor-in-chief of Museum Management and Cura Curatorship. He's worked in and around museums for the past 35 years as a director, consultant, author, editor, archaeologist, board member, teacher, and volunteer. He's the past president and CEO of the Glenbow Museum, Art Gallery, Library and Archives in Calgary, Alberta, and was founding director of the Prince of Wales Northern Heritage Center and founding executive director of the Science Institute of the Northwest Territories. Robert is the author of Museums in the Paradox of Change and Museums in a Troubled World. He has a doctorate in archaeology and teaches at the University of Calgary. So, first of all, Please welcome our guests, real and virtual. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to you to get the video going, Becca. Thank you. 
My name is Bob Jaynes and I'm a former museum director and the editor of Museum Management and Curatorship. I did a Future of Museums video back in 2009 based on my book Museums in a Troubled World wherein I discussed the relevance of museums in light of various global issues impacting society. Nearly five years later, the world is even more troubled and the role of museums in addressing these issues is largely unexamined and unresolved. I've worked in and around museums for the past 38 years, and my personal mission has always been to ask and answer the question, what does it mean to be a human being? This question has become increasingly more important now, as each of us must figure out what it does mean to be a human being when every living system is in decline, and the rate of decline is accelerating. I regret to think that this question should be the central preoccupation of our lives. It will be for our children. As for our grandchildren, who knows? But the year 2050 will undoubtedly be markedly different than the privileged lives we lead today. It would seem that the museum community is sleepwalking into the future, along with the rest of society. We've now reached the threshold of 400 parts per million of climate warming carbon in the atmosphere for the first time in human history, with no discussion or outcry from the citizenry, the media, much less the intelligentsia. The 400 ppm threshold is a dire wake-up call for each of us to adopt clean energy technology and reduce our carbon emissions. Our profound challenge is actually to reduce our fossil fuel use by 50% by 2050 in order to forestall the worst impacts of climate disruption. Because of this, museums must really become intellectual activists. And by intellectual activism, I don't mean creating new knowledge, but using existing knowledge and making it more understandable, useful, and accessible. And you already know what one of the most vexing issues of our time is, and that's climate change. It's been noted that the public debate around climate change in the United States is no longer about science, but it's about values, beliefs, and ideology. I suggest that the same thing is also true in Canada. Note our federal government's single-minded commitment to tar sands development in Alberta. If you're opposed to tar sands development, you're opposed to the well-being of Canada. What we actually need rather than conservative economic ideology, is a thoughtful and immediate societal discussion on the full range of the technical, social, and emotional dimensions of climate change. Museums are grounded in a sense of place, they're committed to a sense of stewardship, and they're universally respected as social institutions, and they can readily serve as the vital bridge between science and the public interest by initiating and hosting this dialogue. My question is this, what is the role of museums in charting a path to sustainability that preserves and uses our irreplaceable cultural legacy? Like it or not, this question lies at the heart of contemporary museum management and governance. No amount of digital technology, gaming, or robotics will be of any use if the biosphere dissolves. So in considering the role of museums in charting a path to sustainability, I'd like you to think about three questions. First, why do we believe that museums may abstain from addressing societal needs and aspirations and be absolved of greater accountability, especially at this time of profound socio-environmental change? Second, what is your museum's higher calling? Meaning, what public value do you wish to add to your community and the world? And third, when you think about your museum, where does it sit on the continuum between internally focused and externally mindful? Happily, some museums are paying attention. Take note, for example, of the American Museum of Natural History's Museums and Climate Change Network, or the Manitoba Museum's new interactive exhibition intended to save Lake Winnipeg from ecological disaster. But there simply aren't enough museums doing this sort of work. Nonetheless, I remain optimistic about museums because they've existed for centuries, unlike the vast majority of business corporations. Museums have always had some sort of adaptive intuition. I don't know how else to put it. 
to reinvent and transform themselves, however slowly and unconsciously. Museums have evolved through time, from the elite collections of imperial dominance to educational institutions for the public, and now to the museum as mall, an appendage of consumer society. The museum as mall is the latest chapter in this trajectory and really is the dead end of materialism, overly concerned with leisure, entertainment, and consumption. The museum's next iteration must now be defined, and I submit that that agenda is crystal clear, and it must be grounded in museums providing sustained and substantive public benefit. In short, museum professionalism and the museum's yearning for popularity must now make room for the durability and well-being of individuals, communities, and the natural world. This is the work that really needs to be done. Thank you very much for listening, and all the best with your important work. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Alice, and um, I did. I should probably say when I worked in museums many years ago, that included working in the Energy Futures Gallery at the Science Museum in London, which is an example of a museum quite a long time ago. This is over a decade ago. Really trying to address things like energy challenges and cl around climate change in particular, but that was the BP-sponsored Energy Gallery. Um, and we were given as staff a briefing of what to do if Greenpeace turned up. And we were kind of, we were just like gallery staff, so we were kind of annoyed about having to work at BP. And a couple of friends of mine who also were doing the same job as me were really into human rights stuff at the time. We were all quite young. Uh, and they were sort of like, they discovered how awful some of the stuff in, uh, involving Shell and the Niger Delta had been. And um, they were really annoyed at the museum's interaction with some of the oil companies. Um, but we didn't have any power as sort of 21-year-old students on a part-time job at a weekend. So we were really hoping Greenpeace would turn up. And they never did. Um, <laughs> I, I later took some Greenpeace staff around there and um, they just sort of decided actually it was quite a bad gallery, which is probably true. And actually as a member of staff, I just sat there and watched lots of visitors go in, clock the BP logo, kind of pull a face and walk away, never interact with it. Or if they did go in, just kind of a bit puzzled by the whole thing. Um, so that's just as to start off with the cautionary tale uh, if people do start trying to do this kind of active work and talk about climate change in museums as Bob is uh, asking us to and I thought that was a lovely talk to I found it quite inspiring um, but we should be careful of, of how we do that um, now um, it's quite clear that um, the oil industry likes science museums. Um, this became really obvious to me not long ago when some colleagues of mine at the small NGO platform in London that do a lot of work on oil sponsorship in the arts. In fact, they've just this week been having a big, the end of a three-year legal battle. They hope it'll be the end. It may still just be an important stage in a three-year legal battle um, with the Tate Art Gallery to get more information about some freedom of information requests they put in about how much money they take from BP and what the precision of, their rela of the Tate's relationship with BP is. And the Tate are being really cagey about it so that um, I mean, it's made the, the Financial Times and the Guardian just this morning I think it's quite a big news story in the UK but they did some work on on how much money these um, museums and art galleries get from the oil industry and they wanted to show actually that it's only a very small amount of money that they get from it so all this stuff about oh we need the money from the oil industry to get it's actually very small and maybe they don't need that money and why are we giving them quite so much advertising space and why are we giving them that much power over our institutions uh, particularly in the UK funding context it was a bit of a kind of like standing up for owning our public institutions anyway we did they did this really nice infographic and you might notice that they've kind of played with the, the shell and BP logos a bit here um, and um, I don't want you to get too tied in with kind of like I mean the top one was just to show, yeah, as it, this, at least in the UK, it looks like it's actually quite a small section of, of, of their budgets. I think we should pay, pay attention to those fact that they're still reasonably large amounts of money, and museum staff would say that's still really important for allowing them to do anything like educational programs. Most of the rest of the budget is just kind of letting them survive, um, and so often this extra 500,000 can be the thing that allows you to put on things like outreach projects to inner city schools, things like that. Anyway, 
away from just the UK funding context, this one, I mean, they're just UK institutions, but I think it's probably a pattern that we'd see, certainly in Australia and the US, where I've, I've also worked, and probably other countries as well. Um, this is sort of Venn diagram. We've got Shell and BP, the two. Um, and if you look at the, the different institutions that they fund, so the Shell fund, the National Gallery, the National Theatre, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Maritime Museum, the Natural History Museum, the Royal Opera House, and the Science Museum, and BP also fund um, the British Museum, the Royal Shakespeare Company. Portrait Gallery, but the, the four institutions in the middle, the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum, the Maritime Museum, and the Royal Opera House, three out of the four of those are science and technology museums. The only reason the Natural History Museum isn't in there is that they stopped taking funding from um, Shell a few years ago after some protests. Uh, but they could be. I'm sure Shell and BP would love to sponsor the Natural History Museum, and in fact, the main hall of the Natural History Museum, which is world famous, this big cathedral to, to science that it's known as, it was built by Richard Owen back in the 19th century with a big, giant diplodocus in the middle of it. It's a really iconic, famous, beautiful bit of, of architecture and, of, and probably iconic Natural History Museum. Um, it's being rebranded the Michael Hintzey Hall after um, he, he doesn't work in the oil and gas industry, but he does also fund, along with having given a load of money to the Natural History Museum, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, which is one of the key um, organisations for climate Skepticism, certainly active in the UK, but internationally too. Um, so you can clearly see there's an interest there too. So anyway, they're interested. And um, why are they interested? So I'm going to go through some of the things that the, the branding of Shell or BP in these art galleries, the Koch Brothers too, what it gives them by their association with, with science, uh, technology and natural history. And also, I'm going to also say a little bit about what I think we can do about it. But back to my cautionary tale of the Science Museum, of what happens when you... Um, when you start letting, um, then you, when you start having climate change exhibitions, but you get them sponsored by Shell. Chris Rapley is a world famous climate scientist. I have a lot of admiration for the guy in many ways. He does an awful lot of work about um, uh, encouraging climate scientists to do communications work with the public and arguing that we need to reform some of our institutions around science and some of our cultures in science allowed to do that. He was briefly director of the Science Museum, and one of the big inspiring things he did was he went, no, we're the National Museum of Science and Industry in the UK. We need to have a climate change gallery. And he built one and he got some funding from Shell to do it. I have with me today two very special guests, James Smith, chairman of Shell UK, and Andreas J. Goss, chief executive of Siemens. Now, um, the Science Museum is about making sense of the science that shapes our lives. And arguably, there's no greater scientific issue confronting mankind at present than climate change. So that's why we put together this gallery. But, but why is it that you wanted to support us to do so? I happen to like science, and I really like the Science Museum. I think the Science Museum is a wonderful institution, and I rather like the atmosphere, because I think the atmosphere matters to us. It enables life on Earth, and it looks after us, and therefore we have to look after it. Our strategy will be directed to the need to tackle climate change. We hope the public will understand why our strategy is that way. Secondly, we want young folks to get interested and excited about this. Brilliant. Andreas. Climate change, as you said before, is one of the biggest challenges and we consider that as well. It's one of the so-called megatrends that we focus our strategy on as a global provider of infrastructure solutions. And as uh, James has said, young folks is, is the key target group. We want them to get into the game, to get interested and to understand what it is all about. The messages of the gallery are that the uh, scientific evidence is that climate change is happening and there are risks associated with it. Can I take it that your companies recognise this and that it's in your, your business plans to respond? Yeah, I mean, I think the fundamental science is crystal clear that the climate change is a risk. And I believe climate change will get tackled sooner or later. Far better to start sooner, far better to put it in the business strategy, because then we have time to develop the, the big new technologies that are going to be required. We have time to put the new economic incentives in place. We have time for the public to understand as well and to support the development of these new technologies. So starting sooner seems to me fundamentally to make business sense. Andreas? Yeah, no question. I mean, it is real. It is there, it is in our focus, and that also means that eventually it's in our business plans. So we consider it as something that we call one of the major mega trends that will determine the development of this planet and also our quest to basically provide solutions for it. So the sooner we start and the better we, uh, we work on the issue, the, the more solutions we find and the earlier we can implement them. I think there is a view that there is a green race beginning, perhaps the third industrial revolution. We need young people to uh, help 
provide the technological solutions. So I guess we're all uh, looking for the same thing here, encourage young people to take an interest in the science. I, I mean, I think with every challenge comes opportunity. If we're invigorated by this challenge, by the opportunities that new technology create, recognising too that business is a competition between different companies, so if you can see the future, you hope a little bit better, and if you've got scientists you hope are a little bit better, and you can produce better technologies, then these new trends create new business opportunity for you. Given the timescales that we operate under and given the swiftness of the development, I think we as mankind must be very, very fast in terms of bringing up our knowledge about the issue, training people, educating new generations to be the pioneers of the future. Well, the, the purpose of the gallery is, is quite explicitly to increase engagement, deepen understanding, allow people to make up their own minds. So all I can say is thank you so much for the support that you've given for this amazing new gallery, Atmosphere, Exploring Climate Science. Yeah, thank you. You're quite welcome. Um, I don't know if any of you have read uh, Naomi Klein's new book, um, um, but certainly some of the things she says about um, the interest of um, the interest in climate change from particular areas of industry is something that we should maybe be worried about, particularly people who think of it as an opportunity, which was interesting to see that coming through. So you see climate change being covered at the Science Museum, but only when you say thank you so much to Shell at the end of it. Uh, thank you so much for climate change. Um, and um, also when you have to spin it as an opportunity, as a business opportunity. I, I personally find that incredibly crass. And I think that, I mean, you can just see kind of Chris Rapley sort of like keeping this grin on his face because he knows he has to be nice to the sponsors. Uh, but I, I think that's something they should be really ashamed of. And it's really interesting that if you go and visit the gallery, there's a long kind of like extra bit under the bit that says thank you to our sponsors, um, which sort of explains that Shell really cares about climate change. It doesn't normally have that. If you ever go to any kind of museum or art gallery and you see a thing from the sponsor, it just normally has the logo. But they, have to, they feel that they have to have an explanation because they know it's problematic. We also get from that a real sense that... Um, Shell, in that case, but I think in lots of con other contexts and other companies and individuals, want to say that they love science. And I think they do love science. I think there's a bit of an urban myth that the various forces against action on climate change are anti-science. In many ways, they love science. And that is at the heart of why they're so interested in these sorts of, place, uh, these sorts of exhibitions. And I think scientific research itself. So what are the three key things that they get from that? Well, one of them is it allows them to frame how we talk about climate change in society. So we saw there climate change comes branded, or action on climate change comes branded by Shell. It has a car. It's up for debate about whether action on climate change will involve cars. Um, and uh, we talk a lot about technological solutions, and we also talk about business opportunities. Um, we should also, I think, reflect... Well, there are, despite that, there are probably very rare examples of bad science on climate change in museums, I think. There were some arguments about um, the Coke sponsored um, gallery in the Smithsonian, which I haven't personally seen, so I don't feel I can comment on the validity of it, but it, there certainly seems to be some really quite worrying reviews. Um, Joe Rom wrote one in particular when it opened a few years ago about how it used uh, particularly odd descriptions of, of the history, of uh, natural history um, and of historical timescales to kind of suggest that um, climate change was just something that happens and humans evolve and I, I think there's certainly reasons why we might raise an eyebrow and be concerned. The thing I'm most worried about more is the thing that gets missing. Oh, so oh, I should also say in that London one where there is a game you can play where you have to dig loads of fossil fuels out the ground as quickly as possible. And you kind of expect at the end they go, oh, well, whoops, you destroyed the planet. But no, they go, well done, take some points. Um, it did actually did take me four visits to find that game though, it's quite well buried. Um, but they do, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things missing in there. For one, a critique of the oil and gas industry or even an, ex an sort of expression that's there other than the logo. There's a way in which the logo and the sponsorship actually buys them a way to hide. So they're there visibly and they get kind of to sort of uh, look positive and it looked good because they sponsored this bit of science ex education. But they get to hide. So they had a big art exhibition that's running for around for two years across the whole of the museum looking at climate change, which is a really good thing in lots of ways. And it included some great art pieces on how awful and dangerous the coal industry was, but there was nothing on oil or gas. It was as if oil and gas, in a, if you're talking about all the history of climate change and, the en and our energy infrastructure, as if oil and gas didn't exist. And so I, I, I said, and this was um, just a personal conversation with a member of staff there, they weren't talking on record, you know, I said, look, do you not feel it's a bit weird that you haven't interrogated, like the history of Shell is quite interesting anyway, don't you want to tell it? Um, and they were, well, we can't talk about that because then it would look like we were talking about the sponsors and we were doing PR. 
And that, I mean, that if, we, if I had the same problem as a journalist or as an academic, that, that kind of conflict of interest would completely destroy my authority. And yet museums seem to think that that's OK. And so there's a way in which they kind of hide behind it. Um, I think it also... Um, we've also got to think about how we unlock the ability to have an exhibition only if it gets sponsorship. So the bulk of the money comes from other sources, but then the only reason you'll be able to build this new exhibition is if you can get it sponsored by somebody. Now you think about what things we don't have in science museums and natural history museums. So I think Bob's right, we don't have enough on climate change, nearly enough. Um, we don't have much on slavery in our science and technology museums, which I think is quite disturbing. We don't have a gallery of industrial accidents. We don't have stuff about disability. We generally put washing machines, if we do have them, in the basement, and you see mas the machines of war and machines of fossil fuel extraction right at the front. Why do we do that? Science Museum is finally building this amazing new media gallery, but only because they managed to get sponsorship from Virgin. There's all sorts of things. I'm sure their, gallery, their exhibitors and um, the scientists and historians who work for them would love to present, and they can't because you need to have something that will get sponsorship. And that limits our ability, it limits our vision of the future, about what we're going to talk about, about our past and our futures in museums. They can only be unlocked by those people who've got a big chunk of money that they can contribute. Um, but it also gives, so it gives you a chance to friend the debate. It gives them a lot of greenwash, and I think it gives them a lot of the symbolic power of science and technology beyond that. Um, it gives them straightforward greenwash because science talks about... Um, nature so they can spot especially in natural history museums they can sponsor things that look like the natural world and it looks like they have a connection to the natural world same reason why they sponsor art galleries with lots of beautiful pictures and paintings of the countryside um, it also gives them a kind of greenwash because they can sponsor particularly in tech museums things about clean tech so things like there are there's a there's a wind blade a wind turbine blade in the science museum that's sponsored by shell for example things like that makes them look like they're doing positive action when maybe they could be doing a lot more. Um, but it also gets the cultural credibility of science. It makes them look intelligent and intellectual and as if they're hoping for the future. And also the huge social power that science education can help give, particularly people who are disadvantaged. So an, you see this, uh, I think I've given honourable mention to Wired UK magazine that's got an advertorial from Shell about all the amazing work they're doing to help people in the Niger Delta. Uh, which I just, I mean, if you look, talk to a human rights campaigner about that, they'd just be shocked. Um, uh, and also... Um, quite a lot, uh, also BP sponsorship of Women's Day, uh, International Women's Day. Um, and then, but this is, I think, is the best example because it really shows off how groups like Shell love science and love the kind of symbolism it can give them about how they're part of hope for the future and making the world better. And also how they managed to pay Pele to help them do this. This, this just got released this week and it's football at museums, but... Um, oh, sorry. Shell and Pelé, we are here to launch the first pitch powered by the football players themselves. This pitch has two things that we love it. First is a young generation of football players. The second one, plenty of sunshine all the time. So the solution Shell gave is to put together solar energy with kinetic panels. So every time people walk, run on the tiles, energy is being harvested. Today we've laid them underneath some astroturf in a football pitch. So the people you see playing football behind me, we're harnessing their energy and we're storing it and we're using it to power and light the football pitch itself. For the first time, we give a kickoff of one the soccer field who gonna bring the light for the new generation. Make the Future is an initiative that Shell is launching um, to inspire and engage younger generations and millennials to go into science. A partir de 5 horas da manhã tem gente aqui até meia noite. Isso gerou reforma nos bares todos, nas casas em volta, né? A criançada poder jogar à noite depois da escola sem correr o risco de chegar aqui e não ter luz. What if your idea could change the world? Make the future. Make the future with Shell International. Uh, there are, have been, they have been having quite a few people laughing at them about that hashtag, if you check the hashtag, as you might imagine. Um, but I mean, I think that's just a classic example of um, 
it really shows off the, the, the power of the symbols that science can give you. We're helping the future. We're, we're helping young people. We're making the world safe. And I, I think this idea of a, um, a football pitch powered by the players themselves is so inspiring. It's wonderful. And yet everyone has to go, thank you, Shell, for making this happen. We'll just ignore all the other things that you've done that make things problematic. Um, so, but that, I think that just shows you why it's so powerful and what they can get out of it. And why I think the scientific community need to stand up for themselves and go, no, you are not allowed to take our cultural resources like this. Um, so there's the, the three things that I think they get out of them. They get out the chance to frame the debate and hide behind the logos and not be part of the debate and not be part of the discussion. Um, they get access to all the symbolic powers of science, the greenwash, the access to nature, the idea of sort of future and hope and technology and being able to change things, the rationality and claims to authority that scientific ha science have. And also, finally, I think we need to appreciate it also allows them access to the people. It allows them access to people like Chris Rapley. It also allows them to all the kids that might grow up to be scientists. One of the big reasons why they do so much work in science education is very sensitive quite plainly, they want to recruit people. And, uh, and well, the scientific community often turn around and go, actually, we expect them to pay for it because they're making a lot of money off our workforce that we've trained up. They should pay for it. And there is kind of an argument about that. But they're getting to frame the debate about it. You see them very active also in careers advice around lots of universities about trying to get the best graduates. You've got to appreciate that the, the oil and gas industry runs on science and engineering. Um, and... This, I think, leads us to one of the things we can think about what we do with it. First of all, we need to cut off that power supply. And one of the things I think that's potentially opening up a big space for a lot more change in the way in which the debates and the social, the various political actors involved has been the divestment movement. So we've seen universities have divestment groups where they've said, well, we need to stop our endowment in the university being used to, to fund oil and gas and, uh, and coal. And you see various universities, that are colleges that have said, no, we're going to divest at least from coal. Now, I think this is quite positive, not just because they've said that, because it, it, but because it allows those groups of social actors, the people who care about climate change, whether they're scientists or not, and a, 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 academics and scientists as well have been involved in this, to collect together to think about how they can work on that. And the next stage, I think, has to be thinking about not just the economic resources that those universities give the oil and gas industry, but the people. They need to stop you know, the, the power supply of not just the money, but the people. I mean, you start criticising other members of the scientific community for being involved in that. We've seen this in the anti-war movement for decades. We need to start extending this to climate change. I mean, you think about how we can divert some of our funding around science. So instead of funding research that helps the oil and gas industry, we need to spend more money on things like science museums and see things like science museums as part of the scientific activity, that sharing the science as well as doing it and finding new science is part of being a scientist. And we shouldn't be spending it on training loads of more people to go and work in the oil and gas industry. We should be training it to talk about climate change with the public and to train people to come up with new ways of dealing with climate change. And the other thing I think we should do is go into our museums and disrupt them and show them off for being quite so silly as they are and how limited they are and how much they're missing and so here's my final video and I think it's one of the more inspiring bits of science communication I've seen in a long time it's done by a group of artists in London Liberate Tate who've done a load of different work um, in complaining about oil and um, oil industry sponsorship of art galleries and what they did is they went to the uh, a new gallery at the Tate Britain which was going to hang um, history of British art um, for the last several hundred years and they said that coincided with the industrial revolution and the huge increase in uh, carbon emissions. And so they took the Keeling curve um, data, well, also the, the further, more historical stuff before the Keeling curve stuff, but parts per million you may have come across, you know, the idea of thinking about how much of a concentration of carbon there is in the atmosphere um, that we've got for various different bits of empirical research that you can trace it back. And they took it, they took that data um, for the last hundred years and they turned it into a kind of poem and they walked around the galleries that were hung chronologically with the art, all these beautiful pictures of the English countryside that BP wanted to associate their name with. And they just walked through it chanting the parts per million, doing something that the science museum, the art galleries, all the other cultural institutions where we should be talking about climate change weren't doing. Um, and they did it and this is them. And in the process, they showed up how how close the relationship is between um, BP and the Tate, uh, but also what they're missing because of that.
400. 400. 400. 400. 400. 400. very beautifully used history and art and science to make an intervention to make us feel something that had been kind of washed away in their cultural institution and I'd like to see people do more and more of that in the arts uh, in the science and natural history museums and I really welcome things like this project because I think this is going to be the start of us having this very important conversation that we need to have because Chris Rapley when he was talking to the guy from Shell said there's this great industrial revolution coming and we need an industrial revolution and probably we do in order to be able to find ways to deal with climate change. We need that kind of mass social and political action which involves technology be able to deal with it. But you've got to remember that before we ever had the industrial revolution, we had the scientific one. And that's what we really need. We need a revolution in the way in which we do and act on science. Thank you. That's right. Hi, I'm Kurt Davies. I run something called the Climate Investigation Center. Um, old friends with Becca, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate today in this. I specialize in tracking corporate funding of think tanks, front groups, and other institutions that try to misinform us about climate change, somewhat intentionally. Uh, there are documents going back to the 90s which are uh, it's very clear that they wanted to intercept the scientific dialogue to undermine uh, the public's understanding of climate change in order to undermine the policy arena. Um, here in New York this week is a fairly historic uh, event with Ban Ki-moon, the head of the UN, convening a, a, a giant session with world leaders to try to figure out this problem. Um, there is, has been a stalemate on policy and I believe in, it is in part due to a concerted campaign over the last 40 years and really over the last 20 years and increasingly uh, to undermine science, to undermine the way that you and I understand this problem and the gravity of it. So I'm going to, I, first of all, I grew up in the Natural History Museum in Philadelphia, the Academy of Natural Sciences. I feel like it's a really crucial part of my childhood and my the basis of my environmental ethics was going there and seeing the collections and taking classes and um, learning. And it's part of why I was into science, but I was also there and the Franklin Institute because I was into science. But the value of those, those institutions and those uh, monuments in my life and in my children's life, um, my daughter, when she was young, fell in love with a giant marlin at the Smithsonian in DC. And it was our destination. She didn't want to go to the carousel. She wanted to go see her marlin, this big stuffed fish. I don't know why, but it, it was important to her. And that, you know, at three, you do what they tell you to do. <laughs> so, um, you know, th these things, the museums are so vital. And th so that's why this project is incredible. And I, I, so I want to take us back and put this in the context of why the Koch brothers, why we are so worried about the Koch brothers' infiltration of museums. Why are we concerned about the messages that our kids and that we are getting on science? And I want to drop back 40 years, 43 years exactly, to this memorandum, which was written by a tobacco scientist, Lewis Powell, who was then nominated to the Supreme Court by Nixon. And he wrote a memo to the Chamber of Commerce saying that Basically, the corporation and corporate interests were being overrun by the left in the 60s. This is 1971. That cultural institutions, universities, the judicial system, the government, the media, everything had been taken over by left-leaning anti-corporate things, ideas, and that they needed to, to take it over themselves. The corporations needed to be more political. And they weren't very political before that. There weren't a lot of campaign contribution controversies. There wasn't the incredible pressure on the political system. And I just urge you to read this sometime. Look up Powell Memo and just read it. It's an incredible battle plan that they started in 1971 and they have executed. Everything you hear about from uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, to Americans for Prosperity, to the Competitive Enterprise Institute, to the Cato Institute, American Enterprise Institute, the Chamber of Commerce itself, all of it was, a lot of it was born 
from this battle plan, and the Kochs were major participants in it. So in 2010, we, uh, I was at Greenpeace at the time, we did a report based on uh, looking at the, uh, the Kochs and their influence on, um, on this dialogue, their funding of climate denial. We found at the time there were over $50 million they had given since the 90s to institutions who were speaking uh, of an anti, on an anti-regulatory, anti-climate science, attacking scientists, attacking scientific institutions, attacking evidence of climate change and trying to undermine uh, the, the dialogue on climate. That has risen now to 67 million that Greenpeace has tracked. And this is a little video that sort of shows um, in a better way than I can tell you, if I can refresh it, um, how, how that goes on. This is Charles and David Koch, oil barons with personal fortunes of over $21 billion each. But perhaps their greatest achievement is helping convince the world that global warming doesn't exist. In the early 1990s, a scientific consensus began to emerge that burning fossil fuels, such as oil and coal, was changing the Earth's climate. In order to protect profits, these industries devised a plan to reposition global warming as a theory and not fact, and designed what a recent Greenpeace report dubbed the climate change denial machine. It's a network of corporations and think tanks, front groups, who try to lie about the climate science, uh, stop policies that will solve global warming. Of all the dirty energy money that's coming into Washington trying to influence policies, Coke is the worst. Coke is the largest donor, and nobody's ever heard of them. The denial machine works like this. As citizens, we generally don't trust what energy industry representatives tell us about climate change. But we do trust these messages when given to us by experts or by our peers. In 2007, Koch paid scientists to publish a bogus study that polar bears weren't being affected by climate change. They've invested millions of dollars turning George Mason University into what Mother Jones magazine called the haven for climate deniers, and even underwritten denier conferences. But while the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change brought together over 600 authors from 40 countries for their latest report, renowned skeptic Steve Malloy admits that his side is vastly outnumbered. It's really amazing, and, and it's really sort of a band of about 25 people, I guess, you know, maybe a few more. And most recent polls show that more people feel more strongly uh, on, on my side than on the you know, Al Gore side. So how has such a small minority overcome an almost total consensus among climate scientists? Here we come to the true genius of the denial machine, the echo chamber. In order to give the impression of a genuine scientific debate, the Kochs have funded dozens of supposedly independent think tanks whose army of staffers disseminate this doubt throughout the media and launch coordinated attacks on real climate scientists. They've created Americans for Prosperity, who poses concerned citizens. A stop in Wichita today for a national group on a hot air balloon tour. A hot air tour, a rally against what organizers call global warming alarmist legislation. They fund business groups, women's groups, college groups, seniors groups, and even church groups, while adding to the chorus of climate denial. Add to this the tens of millions the Kochs have funneled into lobbying and political donations, and it's not hard to see why no political action has been taken. The denial machine, it can't change the science, but its brilliance in shaping public opinion has helped the Kochs' income soar, while the rest of us get taken for a ride. So that was a little self-serving that I was in that video too, but you, oh no, I lost my place here. So we released this report. Uh, at the same time, we did a protest at the Smithsonian in, uh, in Washington, um, where, if I can find that, where we, uh, we 
put out a wanted poster looking for the Kochs. So the Kochs funded, as, as I said, uh, this, this exhibit on anthropology, on the evolution of the human race, of the human species. And it says, um, well, yeah, there's been climate changes, but look how adaptable we are. Look how incredible humans are. We've been through it all. We live from the poles to the equator. We're just incredible. And that, that's, that sort of refrain of uh, human adaptability is exactly what the head of Exxon said a year ago when he said, yeah, there may be something happening, but it's an engineering problem. We'll get over it. We'll build a dike around the Rockaways or not. We will, you know, I don't know exactly who he thinks is going to pay for this, but it's not an engineering problem. There is a much bigger problem here. We have a fundamentally imbalanced system. And these guys, the oil guys, want to keep the status quo. They want, uh, they want it to not be understood as their fault. So this was just a, this was really Greenpeace hijinks fun trying to make a point. And Good we morning went to all to of you. Smithsonian. Thank you for joining us today because it was exactly 100 years ago when this building opened its doors for the first time. And in my view, it's very fitting to celebrate by opening the brand new exhibition, the David H. Koch Hall of Human Origins. You see neither of these two men? We're looking for these two gentlemen, David and Charles Koch. Has anyone seen these climate change deniers? You got a minute to cooperate with our investigation? It'll be brief and entertaining. And we're looking for Mr. David Koch, who has funded an exhibit at this museum. David and Charles Koch are two oil billionaires who are some of the biggest funders in this country of the climate denial machine. These guys make a whole lot of money in oil, and then they fund science that tells us that oil's not bad for our climate. Have you seen them anywhere or seen any suspicious climate denial activity? This guy looks vaguely familiar, actually. Yeah, you've seen him recently? Yeah, he bought me a drink once. In, uh... When, where, what kind of drink? These perps make me sick. We can do this the easy way, man. Just tell us where David Koch is. He's wanted for the most reckless of endangerment of our climate and our future. Are you familiar with the Crime Syndicate Americans for Prosperity? If you could provide any information as to the whereabouts of these gentlemen, it would be of tremendous service to all of us on the force. This job doesn't make me any younger. You can do this the easy way or the hard way, you and me. You tell me where he is and we can have a green and sustainable future or we can spend the afternoon downtown. Lucky for you, we're already downtown. And it's a beautiful day. Gentlemen, thank you. Oh, thank you. Please, you at home, if you've seen these men, call us immediately. These are two of the country's worst climate criminals funding junk science for a long time now, and we intend to bring them to justice. We're going to find you. Excuse me. This your car? Whose car is this? <laughs> this your car? Oh, I missed that. So much fun. Um, so this this report we ended up uh, putting out in, 2000, in 2010, two weeks before the Deepwater Horizon disaster, um, which it had nothing to do with, but it was kind of mushed into the news cycle. Uh, we made a lot of news in Europe and ended up getting uh, the New Yorker wrote an amazing piece on the Koch brothers, the first piece that anybody had ever read, read on them, on a company that they, they said uh, was the biggest company you'd never heard of. Now they're putting advertising on national TV to brag about themselves and try to explain themselves because they are now known as a, uh, as a problem. Um, this is another piece of this report was looking specifically at one climate denier. Uh, no, it's not. Uh. So here's a guy, Dr. Willie Soon, who works for the Smithsonian Harvard Astrophysical Observatory, which is in Cambridge, which is associated with Smithsonian loosely. Smithsonian is, a, is an interesting institution where it's sort of public and sort of not. Um, we put in a freedom of information request to the Smithsonian to ask for information about Dr. Soon and found out that over the past decade he's received over a million dollars from Exxon, from Southern Company, a giant coal burning utility down in the southeast, uh, from uh, different, different fossil fuel sources. Basically all of his income, all of his funding is from fossils and he's an astrophysicist and he's the one who published the study saying hey the polar bears are fine everything's fine Don't look the other way in the arctic so this kind of research shows that these these institutions are easily corruptible by the money uh, the smithsonian also when we were doing the research for the on the uh, the coke exhibit turns out that 
there was a, it almost, it almost happened that the new Hall of Oceans at the Smithsonian was the American Petroleum Institute Hall of Oceans. <laughs> they, had, they had signed the deal. And it was only for Senator Pat Leahy, I believe, who happened to be on the board of the Smithsonian, and this happened to come up at a board meeting, who said, uh, maybe that's not such a great idea to have the oil industry sponsoring the Hall of Oceans. What happens in the next oil spill? Or are they going to be able to talk about oil spills and the impact on the oceans? So, um, but for Pat Leahy, it would have been. And it makes you wonder how much they need that, you know, what, who's guarding the shop in these museums? Who's, you know, who is keeping the foxes out of the hen house? Um, it, clearly, uh, it needs reform. So, and last, I'll leave this just for the most current thing, and apologies that it's all Greenpeace, but I love Greenpeace, and I worked there for 13 years, so um, this is a lot of the work that I built and, and seeded there. We just did a, a piece, my, the team there did a piece on Koch influence on campuses. The Koch foundations and the Kochs themselves have donated over $50 million in the last roughly 10 years to colleges with strings attached. They have a, you know, a contract, a memorandum of understanding with Florida State where they are requiring that the economics professor teaches their form of economics, their free market uh, economics theory. So, this is, and this is not a joke. This is you know, a, a literally guiding the way our children are taught economics. Uh, tons of money, half the money has gone to George Mason University outside of DC where they have built their whole uh, economic or their whole academic infrastructure that backs up their front groups, that backs up their political philosophies. So I think that their their role in museums is part of a bigger plan. They have a, a social plan for all of us, and if we don't want to participate in the Koch brothers' social plan, we have to take action. This um, this campaign, the Natural History Museum, is part of that, and I would uh, I answer any of your questions on the Kochs and their role in climate denial. The importance of this now is that the UN, the entire basis of the UN action, the discussions on when and how and how fast we act to solve climate change is based in science. It is driven by science. Science is the engine of the train that drives policy. The UN has its intergovernmental panel on climate change, issues reports with three phone books thick, if we have phone books anymore. And the, this is the guidance. This says to governments, we must act now or we go over the cliff. If that is undermined in any way, we don't act and we end up with more disasters and more cost to society. So this is the first step. And again, thanks for being here and thanks for letting me be here. So, um I think we have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to use my prerogative as a moderator and ask the first question. Um, and it's sort of targeted towards both of you because it kind of goes right in between, which is, Kurt, you talked about there being direct influence through both think tanks and what think tanks are able to publicize, and also direct influence in terms of um, research centers at universities, perhaps um, uh, chairships, and so on and so forth. Have we seen any direct influence in museums in terms of the content of exhibits? Or is it, as Alice seemed to suggest, happening through association and more of a sort of symbolic, well, we're on the side of good because as you look at this, you'll look up and scan and see shell and you'll hopefully not, you know, that there'll be an associative logic even if there isn't a real logic. Um, well, I think there does. I you might be able to speak about the human origins at the Smithsonian because it, uh, certainly it's flagged up on something that I'm. Well, I'm going to DC next week. I'm going to have a look, see what's there now. But um, I, I can't talk about that. But um, and there are a few kind of. There's the Perot Museum of, in Texas, which has got a fracking experience, which sounds quite exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think apart from this weird uh, gallery exhibit in the Science Museum where you dig for fossil fuels, it, it did take me several visits, and I'd already reviewed it for The Guardian and taken several activists around it to look through in detail before I'd found it. It was really buried. It's not that bad, it's, but it's what's missing. You do go out of it going, yeah. hmm, climate change isn't that bad. It's kind of bad, but we can do something if we drive the right cars, and I'm not sure what's causing it. Humans are causing it. Yes, humans. And it's not specifically talking about the oil industry. So it's the lack of that. That's what I'd say is probably more powerful. Um, but there are a few things where you might worry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think 
you know, David Koch himself wanting to be a sponsor of the dinosaur exhibit at the Natural History Museum here in New York or the, Anthropo the Hall of Origins, it's almost about him. Uh, he's very much about him. And he, he went to MIT. He's not a dumb person. He's a scientist himself. He's, he certainly knows better. I think one of the key things is whether they know better and they're still funding Americans for Prosperity to lie to us and lie to policymakers and get 75 politicians to pledge they'll never do anything on, 75 House of Representatives members to pledge they'll never do anything on climate change once they get elected. That's direct corruption of the system. But I think your question, you know, I think part of it is greenwashing. Why would the American Petroleum Institute want to sponsor the Hall of Oceans? And why not the Hall of Minerals or maybe the Hall of Butterflies or something? You know, it's a deliberate act because they're in the oceans and they want to seem a good neighbor. And it's goodwill. It's generating goodwill. It's free advertising that they are a partner in science. I think also they are very specifically interested in building more scientists. As you said, they, they are engineers. The whole staff is scientists and engineers and petroleum engineers and specialists. The Exxon funds a ton of science education, just straight out engineering programs. They, they want to generate more talent that they can derive their, uh, their business profits from. But I, you know, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a combination. The answer is not that easy. I don't, I will say, Smithsonian took great pains to say that the Kochs did not have editorial control over the content of the Hall of Origins. But would a staffer designing that exhibit have thought twice about including a chapter on the 20th or 21st century? Mm -hmm. um, or would they say, ah, maybe I won't go there, you know, or some, you know, somebody thought of the idea and someone else said, I don't think that would be a smart thing to do. So there's subtle editorial control and then there's overt. Great. There is some stuff on the BP Energy Gallery at the Science Museum from BP themselves saying that they were consulted heavily and quoting members of staff at the scientists, Science Museum saying how um, much the Science Museum valued their expertise and how great it was working with a sponsor that actually knew about the subject rather than just wanted to give them money. Uh, but the Science Museum claims they had massive amounts of editorial control. If you talk to people who develop that gallery when you take them to the pub, sometimes you get slightly different views. But that's an unreliable source. I'd say this is the same though for scientific research generally, with the exception of a few really bad case studies they have a huge amount of impact about just directing our focus of our energy. So they direct the focus of our scientific energies for research, and they direct our focus for our scientific energies of our interests for the public. And it's, it's looking one way and not the other. You're still looking and you're seeing something real. It's just you're, you're ignoring other important things. That's what I'd say is what's most worrying about it. Excellent. Thank you. Questions from our... Yes. Um, So first of all, thank you very much for coming, and this has been very informative. How much, with the profit motive being what it is, uh, are these sorts of funding structures aimed at opening up new markets for climate change adaptive technologies? Uh, you know, that's a good question, and I don't know that the oil industry is really uh, going to benefit from those, you know, selling the, if, if that's your point, that they would, they would, somebody's going to make money. Somebody is going to make money if they invent really good ways to retrofit the brick buildings of New York to make them adaptable to a climate of Miami, which is what's coming. You know, this city was not built for the climate that is somewhat inevitable at this point, and there's going to be some <coughs> Better be some really innovative insulation techniques and air conditioning techniques to keep people safe in future decades. So, but I don't know that the oil industry, the oil industry certainly is not invested in conservation, in energy conservation very well. They want us to use it. Um, they say they are, and, and in fact, Exxon started a partnership some years ago at Stanford. That's another whole, uh, you know, lens is how. They get into the universities like the Cokes and they start these research programs which result in technology that they then profit from. So they invest in a private or public in, uh, educational institution and then derive the intellectual property and make money on it. But this was a, you know, better engines. So Exxon wouldn't mind us using less fuel but they can charge us more. Um, you know, run all the hybrids you want as long as they're still burning a little bit of gas. They don't want them all be, to be electric cars. 
they wanted to be still fossil fuel driven. But it's really a good question, you know, whether there is a profit motive in adaptive technology. I will say Shell, after it, Shell and BP in the late 90s both jumped ship from the oil industry and admitted the science. And, and John Brown, the head of BP at the time, said, it's real, it's happening. I'm sorry, Shell said, um, it's real, it's happening, it's, you know, we get it, we're, we're on, we're with it, we're with this program to solve climate change. They then invested in, at like BP's Beyond Petroleum, they invested in some alternative technologies. They've now dumped all that investment. They're making mm -hmm. so much money on oil, they have ditched it. I mean, Shell, I have a Shell wind power mouse pad that I still, for some reason, it's still my mouse pad. And they've dropped all those investments. I just thought it was ironic at the time. But it, it, they've dropped all those investments because they're not making enough money. Chevron just kicked its entire renewable energy team to the curb, sold it off because it's just the, the return on investment, the ROI on that is not as much as digging out more fossil fuels and selling them to us. They're making so much money on fracking and on oil drilling. Uh, that's where their base is. And they won't change that uh, without a lot of push. Yeah, I don't see that as a being a sponsorship in museums or even other forms of science communication that I track much, but it might be that it'll be an emerging area and we'll see the more entrepreneurial um, corporate affairs teams at museums and newspapers and stuff working with those groups. What I do think, though, is it is having an impact on the direction of, of discourse around adaptation versus mitigation and, and that the oil industry is interested in that because they, they kind of prefer us to talk about adaptation rather than mitigation, that kind of way in which... To some extent, the climate sceptic discourse is shifting a bit more about, oh, well, yes, it is happening, but it's not going to be quite that bad, and let's just keep... It's, it's becoming less about climate scepticism, more about let's just keep using fossil fuels in a very much more direct way. Um, yeah. and, and one thing to add to that, in addition to that, that's very deliberate. You know, well, it's happening, it may not be as bad, but we'll adapt to it, is a really comfortable space where you're denying the urgency but not denying the fact that there's something happening. That's coupled now with, a, a, I don't know where it came from, but it's clearly coordinated. They are all harping on energy poverty. All the fossil fuel industries are now saying, we are the solution to poverty. Uh, the coal giant Peabody has launched a global campaign called Advanced Energy for Life. It's all about the poor people of Asia and Africa that don't have electricity and how coal is how they're going to get electricity, which is completely ludicrous and destructive. And the IPCC, the UN Science Committee, has found that, in fact, poor people get hurt worst and first by climate change in every case. It's the major finding of the scientists is that poor people get buried by this. People who depend on natural weather to grow their food are really in, in harm's way. So it's, it's not only a destructive and ironic, but it's really harmful that the fossil fuel industry has now adapted this savior pose they're going to save us with fossil fuels and, the, and access to cheap energy, cheap, affordable, and I can parrot them really well, but cheap, affordable energy will solve energy poverty. Sounds great. But in fact, the solution is distributed renewable energy and conservation and better ways to produce your own power. So that's, a, that's another angle on, on how we, how that adaptation versus mitigation, solving the, the emissions, cutting the emissions is a really important debate. Great. And museums and stuff should be challenging that. Yes. And, that, and they're not. And that's where it comes in. And I think that's why there's an element to that particular debate is still there. It, it seems like uh, it's very obvious that money is a significant motivating factor in um, the anti-climate change campaign, for lack of a better word. But is it money? the only motivating factor, or is it money and other things? For the Kochs, um, these are political ideologues. These, these people are very motivated by a very different philosophy of how society should be run. Uh, there's a book, a 2014 book called Sons of Wichita, which is a must read on this, and you learn how they were raised and what ethics they were taught by their father who uh, actually, it turns out, stole intellectual property on how to make oil refineries better and then went to Stalin's Russia and built it over there because he was being sued in this country by the company that actually built most refineries and invented a new form of cracking. People have said that the Kochs, are, it's all about money, it's all about them increasing their profits. I know for a fact that part of their inspiration to get into 
the, the PAL memo mission was driven by the fact that they were being regulated. You learn in this history, in this book, that they were starting to get tagged for spilling and for uh, various infractions because the nascent Environmental Protection Agency was being born and people were starting to watch and regulate and rivers were on fire in this country if, we were, if anybody's that old. This is, you know, part of their motivation is they hate regulations, they hate the government uh, basically and they don't think, they think that somehow the free market will solve humanity's needs and yet uh, so it's partly about their profit center. Um, ironically, in the Obama years when uh, they've been harping about Obama's destructive impact on the economy, um, their wealth has more than doubled. The Koch brothers have gotten richer and richer. So somehow they're making a lot of money while they are, are attacking this government and attacking the EPA for trying to regulate carbon. Uh, so it's, it's a combination and it's very hard to tease out. It's not a simple answer as just profit motives. The corporations like Exxon or Shell or BP, on the other hand, they have one mission. They don't have another business plan or Peabody Coal. They have one way of making money and anything that interrupts that, like a, an effort on climate, is a threat. Yeah, I totally agree that it's for a lot of the individuals I think that work in the oil and gas industry as well, for the, the companies and, and coal industry, companies like um, Shell and BP, they, they will have a multiple different range of reasons, not just about money. Sometimes they believe it for political reasons, for cultural reasons. But a, another side I can add to this is it's not just money that, that allows them to work like this. It's not just money that allows, that means that museums and universities go, oh yes, we must take your, your money. Uh, that is part of it, they're, they're increasingly desperate for the money because of under austerity particularly. Um, but there's cultural links and social links that allow them to do that. So part of it is it's just who they know. So there's, uh, there's lots of people who have worked in the oil and gas and coal industry who, and fracking who um, are involved in the leadership groups of museums and in universities as well. The new director of Imperial College at, in London is a woman. This is a great, big, great thing. She's also a non-executive director. Oh, no, she's on the board at... Uh, Chevron, you know, that they have links and so it becomes, a, oh I trust this person because I'm mates with them or I have a business arrangement with them which is not purely economic and there's also a cultural thing like it, a lot of people seem to increasingly think it gives you respectability if you've got a, if you've got a sponsor. So I think that a part of the, some of the people at the Science Museum who liked, they kind of liked the idea that Shell was going to sponsor their climate gallery. They felt they'd won something, that they were impacting on Shell and that, that they showed, look it's such a big deal that even Shell will sponsor it um, and I think that's a, that's a dangerous position to be put in that we only take our science seriously when it's been stamped by someone who's got a lot of money because we should question why they've got a lot of money and also the ability for science to create new worlds where there are different ways of making money and that our economic system will be arranged in different ways um, as well as the fact that science can also sit outside of that economic system so i think there's a sort of cultural credibility that comes from business oddly that is increasingly having traction um, in scientific and museums yeah. So given the fact that the Koch brothers are consciously manipulating the truth to, you know, perpetrate this, the, you know, their, the continuation of their, their profits and their, their ideology, you, you know, the, Pol, the Powell uh, memo you had mentioned, how do, how do you combat this? Obviously, because I think in a lot of ways they're winning, once they're, they've infiltrated a lot of our institutions, right? The, the, our higher learning institutions, they're, they've got their paid off uh, minions in all these different places. How, how do we combat this? They've got so much money, and a lot of these institutions need money, right? They, you know, our universities are, the, the museums, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They all, they, you know, they need money to, to, to put, put together exhibits. And how do we combat all this money that's, you know, Citizens United uh, ruling the, the Supreme Court, of course, opened a lot, up a lot of dollars in this area to, you know, where they could just, you know, and, and they're, they're, it sounds like they're owning our politicians now, too, with 75 uh, members of the House not willing to vote against uh, climate change uh, legislation. So, or, or, yeah, any, any move in climate change direction, they're not willing to vote. Uh, they're they're going to vote against that. So, so anyway, how do we combat it, basically? And is it, a, is it more of a problem in the U.S., do you think? Or is it, how do, how do we compare, how does the U.S. compare uh, internationally with other, other countries? And I, I know from, we saw an interesting show, it was a Bill Moyers uh, interview about, it was, it was an evangelical uh, uh, representative, actually, who was a scientist, who was very much on the, 
believes in climate change and, and sees the impact it's, it's, it's having on our climate. But in the evangelical, I'm not, I'm not attacking the evangelical community necessarily here, but, but two thirds of, of the evangelicals believe, don't believe in climate change. So you can, so obviously you've got to, if you're going to win the hearts and minds, if you're going to combat, if you're going to win this battle, and I'm, you know, I, I very much believe in climate change myself, and I, I mean, I'm going to march tomorrow uh, on the streets of New York, but how do we combat this and win? Ultimately, we need to get win the hearts and minds if they're if they're infiltrating all these institutions. How do we how do we combat this? What's the most effective way for us to combat this? Anyway, that's a long long winded uh, question there. But. Um, I'll let you talk about. I think your question was largely about America, and so I'll let you talk about that in a minute. But I wanted to say very briefly that we are more powerful than we think we are. We own a lot of these institutions. We own the bulk of them. Um, our staff work in them. The staff in museums and scientists and, and other cultural institutions have power and they can stand up. At the moment, they're scared because they're told they need even a little bit of money and a little bit of credibility that these groups give them in order to function. They're particularly being extra scared because of austerity measures. They need to look around themselves and go, no, they need us. They're vulnerable. There's a really good bit in No Logo by Naomi Klein. She talks about how the change in activism to start attacking brands and how actually vulnerable you become when you start advertising. And you mentioned, oh, like, since they've got all this bad press from the Greenpeace activism and, uh, work, they've started to have to run adver adverts. They've started to have to... The fact they're sponsoring is admission of the fact, the fact they advertise and the fact they sponsor art galleries and museums is an admission of their vulnerability. And these are open spaces, these museums. They're particularly important if you want to do activism in the guts of the scientific community as well as the scientific museums, because they are an open space, an open wound perhaps, but an open space for the, for the science to talk to the public. And we can look through that, through the ways in which these groups like Coke and um, Shell and BP are inter interacting with museums about how they're also interacting with scientific research and scientific training too. We can acknowledge that this is them being vulnerable and we have the power because we can shut those places down or we can disrupt them, we can make them look foolish at very least. And that can change the discourse. So that I, just, I, think, I think it's a big challenge, I do. And I think particularly when you talk about the American um, political system, and I think we have similar problems in the UK too, there's a lot of work to do and there's a huge challenge. But we've got to remember how powerful we are in this and that we've got a lot more power than they would let us like to, or they'd like us to think about. Yeah, and echoing that, it is a global thing, not just a US thing. There are, there's a huge strain of climate denial in Australia driven by the coal industry, uh, in Canada driven by the tar sands industry, and they would like us all to go to sleep and forget that this is a problem. So. The, the answer is we don't have 40 years to catch up to what they've built over the last 40 years, the institutions and the infiltration of the courts and of the, uh, the, the legislature and of the academia and of the media. There's a whole media plan in his, see Fox News. Um, but we can fight back with sunlight and we can you know, show, and this, this campaign uh, the Natural History Museum is going to show and tell other museums to watch their step. And the next time there's, a, there's an option on where they get their money and how they uh, curate their exhibits, people will be thinking about it. And as with the work we do to reveal you know, the, the infiltration of state governments by the Koch apparatus and infiltration of, of uh, academia, this, this uh, work by Greenpeace on campuses is now putting it in the minds of campus fundraisers that maybe some money is too dirty to take. And I think that it, you know, it's, it's a slow grind, but it, it, it takes people paying, paying attention and, and fighting back bit by bit. Well, I think that was a perfect way to end uh, this event. And I want to thank our guests for coming once again. And to thank everybody here. Um, particularly those who actually figure out how to get here going around the seven train. Um, and I want to leave it with Becca talking about the future events. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, thank you um, to Kurt and Alice and Stephen. Um, I want to uh, let you know about the rest of the programming um, as the Natural History Museum is here at the Queens Museum until October 4th. Tomorrow, nothing here. We're all going to be out in the streets for the People's Climate March, so join us there. Um, our mobile museum is a 15-passenger bus that we'll be using for expeditions. Um, to uh, other natural history museums and to environmental um, hotspots around the country. Uh, but tomorrow we will be driving it 
in the March, it runs off of uh, biodiesel made from recycled waste stream veggie oil. And it will be, it's a, outfitted with a trailer hitch that will pull a flatbed with a special message, big billboard. You'll see it tomorrow if you join us. We're, we're marching with the scientist contingent. There's a new network of scientists called Science Stands. We'll be meeting in front of the American Museum of Natural History. Um, that the march kicks off at 11:30, but you should try to get there earlier because the streets are going to fill up and transportation will take a little while. So maybe try to aim to get to the Natural History Museum at like 10:30. Um, next weekend here we have a, a kind of big day on Saturday. Um, a couple of tours back to back from 1 to 3 p.m. The first in the Panorama, which is a to scale model in New York City um, that was built in the, in the 30s. Oh, 64, 65, around the, that World's Fair. And um, that is kind of the marquee piece here at the museum. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It's beautiful. Um, Juan Camilo Osorio of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance um, is an urban planning expert who's going to give a tour of the panorama um, talking about how climate change affects New York City and how urban planning um, uh, affects uh, climate change here and can also um, potentially help address some of the worst impacts. Um, and then after that, uh, another really cool model, this one was built in 1939. This is the watershed model, a 504 square foot model um, uh, built by the Department of Water Supply and Gas and Electricity um, that uh, has New York's watershed. It's a topographical model and West Gillingham from um, from Catskill Mountain Keeper is going to come do a tour called What the Frack Are You Drinking? So it'll be looking at how um, fracking could affect New York's watershed and our city's water supply. And we're also screening a film by Josh Fox, who's an Oscar-nominated filmmaker who did the film Gaslands about fracking. It's a, a short 18-minute film he did called The Sky is Pink, um, which looks more at the political situation here in New York State and um, also at the influence of the um, advertising and PR companies that originally sold us tobacco and are now those same companies selling us fracking. Um, then uh, after that 3.30 to 5.30 we have a panel called Climate Wars Propaganda Debate and the Propaganda of Debate and that's with historian Stuart Ewan um, who writes uh, historically has written a lot about um, the birth of public relations and the history of the public relations industry. Um, Michael Mann, who's a scientist, a uh, climate scientist, whose data set was um, uh, very um, uh, important and influential, featured also in Al Gore's um, The Inconvenient Truth film. Um, it's the kind of hockey stick bar graph. And after that was aired, the wrath of the climate denial machine descended upon him. And he continues to be under attack. He's going to talk about that experience, um, which is also chronicled in his book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. Um, the next day on Sunday, 3 to 5, a panel called Seeing the Display environmentalism's ideological habitat. So part of what we're looking at is um, uh, the ways exhibitions, design, and communication influences what we see as natural. Um, and that's with Peter Anker, Fred Turner, and theorist Jody Dean, moderated by Astra Taylor. And then our last day of workshops is, or panels is Saturday, October 4th. Um, 1 to 3 p.m., Anthropocene, Capitalocene, or Ecology for All with authors Christian Parenti, Jason Moore, and Rasmin Kuchian, and moderated by Liza Featherstone. Um, this panel looks at, well, the, I'll, I'll say one of my favorite quotes from Edward Abbey, which is, capitalism is the ideology of the cancer cell, unlimited growth in a finite system. Um, so this panel looks at some of the kind of violent legacy of capitalist exploitation of nature. Um, and views, in, kind of inquires into how views of natural systems as separate from human systems um, may be a part of the problem. 
that we face in confronting climate change. And finally, our closing panel, which is intended with a forward-thinking note, um, 3.30 to 5.30, is counterpower for climate justice with activists Gopal Dayanani, Eddie Bautista, and Elizabeth Yampier, um, key figures in the environmental, um, in the climate justice movement, been very involved in the um, People's Climate March organizing, um, and they talk about the global climate justice movement in the wake of the march, um, what's next, and how do, how do we build a movement, um, or continue to build one. And um, I think that's it. We're going to go out for drinks if anyone would like to join us. And a big thank you for coming, and we hope to see you more. And check out the naturalhistorymuseum.org. Um, that'll be a, a fully launched site in a week's time with our online virtual museum.